Hi everyone, it's Dr. Sarah here. I thought that I might take the time to start explaining this whole coronavirus situation that we have in Australia at the moment and start taking the opportunity to uh, put forward some suggestions as to how, as a town, we can protect ourselves and our vulnerable members of the community. So I've spent a bit of time overnight uh, working through this and putting together a little bit of information for you. So bear with me, I'll bring it up. Okay, so the coronavirus is a, obviously a new virus and so none of us have been exposed to this before. Um, I think the important thing to consider is that the number of positive cases that we have available to us are really the tip of the iceberg and that it's going to be a little bit more complex than that. Um, the symptoms, or I guess meaning that the number of positive tests really don't reflect the true number of positives in the community. The symptoms can be anything. They can be mild, they can be severe, they can be anything from a tiny runny nose that lasts a few days to really dramatic shortness of breath, fever, cough, sore throat, diarrhea, you name it, pretty well any viral symptoms. More often than not, it's a mild condition. But the reality is that because this virus hasn't been out in the community before, it's really, really very contagious and very spreadable. What we know is that children don't get as sick as other people and that they are acting like carriers. So they are often suffering very mild forms of the illness and it's likely that in a way because of this they're linked to the spread of the virus. What we're seeing is a very high fatality rate. We're seeing that those over 70 are, you know, 15% um, mortality rates in this age group. Initially, the um, projected mortality rate was about 1%, and we're seeing that increase to 5 in the total population at the moment over in, um, in Italy. However, those figures are questionable because of this whole iceberg issue that we have. So moving on. Talking about Italy in particular, I think there's a lot that we can learn from it. <clears throat> now, as of last night, Italy had had just over 9,000 cases and 470 deaths. So that works out to be about a 5% fatality rate or mortality rate. Now, again, just remember the iceberg issue, but this is higher than the 1% that had been reported earlier. So really, we are learning everything we have from Italy. Resources are the issue. So because of uh, the sudden burst of cases in Italy, what is happening is that people are flooding into the hospitals and very, very sick people are needing resources all at once. And because quarantine measures really haven't been put in place in a suitable way, the, the, the spread of the virus has gotten quite substantially out of control. And just like this red line here, what we're seeing over there is that the numbers are, are climbing and the spread is happening so rapidly that then the, there are more sick people presenting together and those sick people presenting together are consuming the resources. Now, the reality is that because of this peak all at once, there aren't enough doctors, there aren't enough ICU facilities to actually take care of these individuals. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what this means is that actually people over there that are over 65 years of age or they are under 65, 65 years of age with significant health problems are actually not even being offered ICU treatment because there isn't any left. There's literally a complete consumption of the resources to the point where they have to prioritise their resources to those that are well and have a high likelihood of recovery. So this is a disaster for them because there are people dying that they, they literally don't have the resources to support. And that's exactly what we are trying to avoid. So what we want to avoid is this, and what we want to create is this. So we want a gentle incline in the numbers, and we want to plateau. We want to control the spread. Now, 
<clears throat> if we do this correctly, what that will result in is that the numbers of ICU beds and hospital facilities and doctors that we have available will actually go the distance. Rather than having all of them consumed and chewed up at once, they will actually be spread over time in such a way that there will be enough beds, there will be enough doctors, there will be enough ventilators, there will be enough, um, you know, powered oxygen and pressured oxygen to use for everybody. So this is what we're aiming for. Now, how do we achieve that? We will get to that, actually. <laughs> My apologies. Obviously, I did this a bit late. I can't even remember the order of it. Now, getting back to it. Who is at the most risk? Let's just sit with that for a second because that's really important when we consider how we achieve it. Now, people at the most risk are those with a low immune system. So those who are on immunosuppressant drugs for things like rheumatoid arthritis or transplants or... Um, you know, recent chemotherapy patients, those with lots of medical problems, so people who have lung disease from smoking, those people with heart problems, those people with multiple different issues that they use lots of different medication for, those with weak lungs. Let's just face it, this is a lung virus. So how it works is it infiltrates your lungs and it fills up the air spaces that transfer the oxygen with gunk. So literally, uh, you just can't move the oxygen into your bloodstream. And that's why it's so dependent on these ventilatory type resources. Finally, we know that those over 70 are at risk. We know that they're the ones that are really going to have bad outcomes and be more likely to need lots more support and are more likely to have uh, complications from the illness and not just be a mild runny nose and a fever for a couple of days. The issue is, again, reflecting on resources, is that when people do get to the stage where they need ventilation, we're looking at their use of ventilation for three to six weeks. That's a long time for one person to occupy resources in a hospital. So again, reflecting on this peak and trough, if all of these people are using ventilatory support for three to six weeks, you can see how quickly and easily we could congest our resources. So now moving on, how do we slow the spread? You know, really what it comes back to is identifying early that you've got symptoms, not going to work with a slightly runny nose or a fever or a sore throat and isolating yourself. Don't come into your GP clinic. Protect those people who have chronic diseases or who are well but are going to the GP because they have other health issues. And instead, give us a call. Give your GP a call and say, hey, look, I've got these symptoms, but these are the things that I wanted to talk through. And all through Australia at the moment, clinics are running their appointments by phone and by telehealth or Skype instead of seeing face-to-face. -face. And that is a, a measure to protect the people who are well and the people who are vulnerable. Apart from that, it's also a measure to protect us as your medical service provider. If you are sick and you're at home, advise your friends and family to stay away, especially those people that are at risk, your grandparents, your aunties, your uncles. Uh, just, you know, tell them, look, it's in their best interest just to keep uh, a distance. Think about basic measures. Think about regular hand washing. Think about not touching people who are unwell. Think about keeping basic 1.5 metre lengths between you and those around you. And, and be conscious about that. Be conscious about door handles. Be conscious about surfaces that are difficult, uh, that aren't cleaned frequently. And really take those extra precautions. Most importantly, remain at home until you're advised that it's safe to return to work and use GP services to help guide you on that. If your children are sick, they are like little mosquitoes. They are spreading this thing really quickly without significant illness. Don't send them to school. Don't send them to kindy. 
the quickest way to spread this virus is to send a sick child to school and then they pass it on to their friend who then takes it home to their sick grandparents. You know, that is how we're going to flood our services and our resources. Finally, if you're at high risk yourself, if you have lung problems, if your immune system is low, if you're prone to illness, if you're on prednisone or methotrexate or other medications which lower your immune system or you just have lots of medical health issues, consider not even coming into the GP to have your regular appointments. Ring us. Protect yourself by actually booking your appointment over the phone or via Skype. We'll help you work through it, but do, do simple things to protect yourself from really what is inevitably going to be some spread of this virus. Now, this is the reality for us, right? In Australia, there are only 2,000 to 3,000 ICU beds. We have very limited resources. GPs are the front line. We are the foot soldiers. And as much as there are flu clinics being set up around the country, the reality is this is a big country and there are issues with access to resources. So people who are unwell will seek help from their GPs, and that's okay. However, we are having difficulty protecting ourselves. There are no masks left. There are no long sleeved gowns. Getting appropriate hand wash uh, is, is getting really, really difficult. It is very hard for us to protect ourselves from, the, from those that are sick and then to protect those that aren't sick from catching it from us when we get sick. There are limited numbers of doctors in this country and there are limited numbers of trained staff. So if we don't plan now to protect ourselves from this virus, what's going to happen is that I will get sick, my staff will get sick and this clinic will have to shut down. Then those who are genuinely at risk will need help and won't be able to access it. And then we will have significant, significantly worse outcomes. So the best thing that collectively we can do is to consider each other, you know, protect us and so then we can continue to protect you. If you're unwell, you don't come in. If you have a virus symptom of any kind, ring us ahead. We'll do the consult by phone. If you're at risk of an infection, again, give us a call ahead. If you're concerned, we will change your appointment from uh, a face-to-face -face consult to a phone or a Skype consult. If all of these measures that we're instituting fail, then we may have to completely close the clinic from the perspective of face-to-face -face operations and move to taking consults from phone uh, via phone or Skype only. Now, there are clinics already doing this in Melbourne, in Sydney, and, and this is the way that that practices are protecting their community and themselves. We may need to go to this point at this stage. I'm willing to see how the spread of the virus plays out and how this community can, and if this community can cooperate with these sorts of measures. So, as I've mentioned, there are 3,000 ICU beds in Australia. Let's make them enough. Call your GP practice, don't visit. Protect your community by thinking about others. This virus will kill people you love if you do not think before you enter, before you leave your home. Please stay at home. Now, I know this seems very doomsday. I know this is alarming. But the reality is, if we don't take it seriously, we won't be able to contain this virus. And what is happening in Italy will happen to us. And people that you and I both love will be really, really unwell and not be able to access the services that they need to keep them alive. So it is time to take it seriously. The virus hasn't made it to our little town of Clermont, but it may in time, and we need to be prepared. So it's time to start practicing these measures now 
and it's time to get into the habit, hand washing, avoiding certain surfaces, basic hygiene measures. It's time to think. And if you're concerned, use the phone. We'll help. Um, let's just work together and let's work through this and protect each other. Thanks for your time.